So good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the completion seminar from Zoe, which is a great step, and I'm really happy. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri people from the Kulam Nation, and all their elders past and present, and all other, all other indigenous elders and people here with us. So I am representing Rea here. It's becoming a bit of a habit for me to represent Rea. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a shame that Rea can't be here because Zoe is actually Rea's first PhD student. That's just she's the first student that Rea has supervised and I have helped a little bit. It's been a real great pleasure having Zoe with us for the last three and a half years. And she's worked, she's start, tackled a really quite difficult project and it has moved around a little bit. But she has doggedly pursued those antibodies and I think she can't, has come up with what is really a wonderful story, a nice story, that like any good project opens up as many questions, new questions as it has answered. And uh, so I don't want to say very much more except it was a real, it's a real pleasure having Zoe with us and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing your nice presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ivo, for the really kind introduction. Um, well, first of all, I would really like you like to thank you all for coming here today. I know it's a really unusual day for a completion seminar, yet you're here, so thank you. Um, so today, I would like to talk to you about how we characterize antibody kinetics against Plasmodium vivax in a low transmission region in Thailand, and why this matters to us. We know that malaria has been a global burden, and it was reported last year that there were more than 200 million global malaria cases in the world. And for every 1,000 people, 60 are at risk of infections. And as far as last year, more than 400,000 people died from malaria. But today, I would like to particularly draw your attention to Southeast Asia. So this region contributes to around 2% of the global malaria cases. And it's been doing fairly well for the past few years, fighting against malaria. But recently, the um, elimination progress has stopped, and the region is still very heavily threatened by one particular Plasmodium species, which is um, Vivax. So Plasmodium Vivax is the dominant Plasmodium species outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, and it is the dominant Plasmodium um, parasite out, um, in low transmission regions like uh, Thailand. A bit on the life cycle, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with already. Um, so the sporozoites enter the body via bloodstream, and can travel down to the liver and invade liver cells. And some of them will mature and release merozoites, which will in fact red blood cells and undergo this asexual cycle to produce more merozoites. And some of these merozoites will undergo sexual cycle instead to form male and female gametocytes. And so these gametocytes will be taken up by another mosquito and finish the rest of their life cycle in that um, mosquito host. So I'm sure you're all aware that hypnozoites um, are really a key feature of Vivax, which really sets it apart from its more famous um, cousin, which is uh, Fasciparum. And the hypnozoites can remain inactive in the liver cells for months, even years. And when they are reactivated, they undergo the same cycle and, um, and leads to new infections and relapses. So now that we know that hypnozoites are really one of the major challenges when it comes to eliminating vivax, um, what that really means is that um, hypnozoites cause up to 80% of the blood stage infections um, via relapses. And during this dormant um, liver stage, um, when there's not much of a blood stage infection going on, um, they cause this low parasitemia below the detection limit of Lyme microscopy, which is the current gold standard for detection in many of the malaria endemic countries. So as you can see that it really leads to misdiagnosis and discontinued transmission. And 
We also know that primaquine is the major medication for clearing hypnozoites. And, um, but the treatment regimen is quite heavily restricted by the fact that it induces severe um, hemolysis in GCPD deficient individuals, which happens to be, unfortunately, one of the most um, prevalent um, enzyme deficiency in human population. So as you can see, that um, mass drug administration with primaquine um, is a really risky move and is not really an option in many countries. And compared to Fasiparam, Vivax also shows this early commitment to sexual development into gametocytes, even before the symptoms are shown. And it also takes Vivax less time to form sporozoites in the mosquito host. And Vivax is also highly adapted to cooler climate. And so together, these features really promote faster and also wider transmission for Vivax compared to Fasiparam. And as humans are potentially the host for Vivax, and what our bodies do in response to a Vivax infection is through naturally acquired immunity, which is defined by the immune responses induced by natural exposure to Vivax. And we know that so far, um, it provides partial protection against clinical symptoms and can develop faster than fasciparin, um, causing heaviest burden in malaria, of malaria in younger children. And this immunity is particularly critical in three different ways. First, it plays a key role in regulating the clinical presentation of the infected individuals. Um, first of all, it is too weak to um, clear the hypnozoites from the liver cells. On the other hand, it is too strong to allow infected individuals to show symptoms. Second of all, it is an important indicator of the immune status. Um, from, from this immunity, we can tell that if an individual was acutely infected or is in convalescence. Thirdly, it can also be harnessed for vaccine development, um, but because as you can tell, that stronger immunity means stronger protection, and that's exactly what we want in an ideal um, vaccine. But unfortunately, this naturally acquired immunity against Vivax is very much understudied. So the key question that we try to answer is how is this Vivax specific naturally acquired immunity developed and influenced after the infection? And the way we address this question is by using um, symptomatic and asymptomatic human cohorts uh, naturally infected with Vivax and establish this total IgG antibody kinetics to compare. And we also look at different types of antibodies, including IgG subclass and IgM. And secondly, we also looked at the level of sequence diversity for each antigen and determined their association with the antibody responses observed in my first aim. And thirdly, we would like to look at how memory B cell responses contribute to the immune response. And the hypotheses for these aims are that antibody kinetics are antigen-specific, antigenic diversity affects antibody responses, and that the impaired memory B cell populations can be one of the causes um, of short-lived antibody response. I will focus on my first aim for now. Before going into the details, I would like to take a little detour and just to describe the process of antibody production in the secondary lymphoid tissues. So here we can see a naive B cells um, being activated upon contact with an antigen, and it will migrate and receive T cell help to induce proliferations and differentiation into short-lived plasmoblast and early stage, some early stage memory B cell response. On the other hand, some of these cells will um, migrate into the B cell follicle and form germinal center, and where they are selected based on the affinity of their surface antibodies with the help of other cell types, including follicular, help, follicular dendritic cells, T follicular helper cells, etc. So this entire process is known as germinal center B cell germinal center reaction, and um, the end products of this germinal center reaction are 
more memory B cells and long-lived plasma cells. So upon re-exposure to the same, same antigen, um, these memory B cells can differentiate into these plasma cells, which are the major type of antibody secreting cells. So um, from that, I'm sure you can have an idea of what antibody kinetics might mean. Um, it is um, a term that we, that, we, that we can define it as how antibody response is acquired, developed, and maintained over time. So there have been a few different papers um, that have been published to characterize a Vivac-specific antibody kinetics over the past few years. But they all have one, um, a few common issues. So first of all, they are often just focused on one or two very traditional antigens. Um, that includes um, merozoite surface protein 1 and also Duffy binding protein. Also, um, these so-called longitudinal studies are often put together with, by just several cross-sectional studies, and hence the, the intervals are quite large. And they also focus on total IgG only and also symp symp oh gosh, symptomatic cohorts. And so there's no clear comparison when it comes to asymptomatic. And lastly, they normally don't have enough of these malaria-naive individuals as um, negative control. So in order to fill in the gaps, so to speak, um, what we have decided to do is to establish antibody kinetics against multiple Vivax antigens. So we think that if you're infected with Vivax, essentially you're exposed to antigens of different life stages and also different parts of the, the parasite. And the, um, the antibody profile against these antigens might also be different. And we also use longer studies with more time points to get a kinetic profile of higher resolution. And lastly, we also um, incorporated larger negative control panel for a better reference as baseline. And we all know that there are also different subtypes of antibodies. And most studies only look at IgG because it is the most abundant type of antibody um, that can be found in all body fluids and is the predominant antibody response against infections. Uh, IgG also has four subclasses, one, two, three, and four. They were named as such based on their level of abundance in the healthy individuals. So um, other than IgG and IgG subclasses, we also wanted to look at IgM, which is another subtype of antibodies. So we all know that IgM is known as the first antibody response induced by an infection, so we basically like to compare the two. And lastly, as I mentioned previously, we would like to compare kinetics between symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. So the study site is in Western Thailand, um, in Tatsong Yang district in Tat province, with relatively low transmission. So I was fortunate enough to be, to be there for about two weeks in the Tatsong Yang and then visit um, there. Um, local malaria clinics and hospitals. So this is just one of their clinics, one of their malaria clinics, and these are just the, the field team members collecting dry blood spot and uh, venous blood samples from the patients. So the symptomatic cohort we use for this project um, consists of patients who were infected at the start of the study and um, we have their plasma samples collected every week for the first two weeks, every two weeks for the first half a year, and every month for the last three months. So that's a total of 17 time points. And these 34 symptomatic patients, um, um, they all show symptoms. <laughs> and we also make sure that there was no new infections throughout the study. And besides the, PB, the plasma samples, we also have their PBMC samples collected at the same group of people at the four time points, uh, which will be used for my memory, memory B cell analysis. And we use the 52 Vivax antigens for this project. These are Fasiparum orthologs, vaccine, 
and serological marker candidates and also antigens with signal peptides and transmembrane domains. So that basically means that they are more likely to be expressed on the surface of the parasites and be uh, detected by our antibodies. So 39 of these antigens are from cell free sciences in Japan, and they are a mixture of traditional and other targets. They are mostly blood stage and full length antigens, and they are expressed in wheat germ self resistant. The other 13 antigens were from here at WeHi and also Boston Institute in Paris. So these are more traditional vaccine candidates and they were mostly expressed in E. coli. And the platform I use uh, is a bit based um, multiplex assay called Luminex. And we have the PNG highly exposed adults as my positive control and three negative control panels including um, Australian Red Cross, uh, Thai Red Cross, which are um, plasma samples from Bangkok with no malaria transmission, and also volunteer blood donor registry, which is essentially plasma cells, um, plasma samples from Melbourne. And so all results were expressing medium fluorescence intensity, which will be converted into relative antibody units based on this plate and antigen specific a standard curve established using the positive control. And just quickly going through on how this Luminex assay works. So um, they can be up to 100 different beads or internally stained with different proportions of red and infrared um, fluorochromes. And so say we pick five beads of different colors and couple five different antigens onto the beads and then mix them with the plasma samples. So antibodies in the plasma samples that are specific to the antigen will bind onto the beads and then we add our anti-human antibody uh, label with PE dye. And then we put all these mixtures together and through the machine, the classification and the reporter lasers were both recognizing um, we'll be recognizing the color of the bead and also quantify the, um, the amount of the PE dye on the secondary antibody. And this is basically how the assay was multiplexed. So as part of the result, first thing that we see is that different antigens have different total IgG kinetic profiles. So if we use the three negative control panel as the baseline and an arbitrary cutoff of six months to categorize the 52 antigens. We see um, 18 antigens are long-lived, nine are short-lived, and the other 25 don't seem to be very immunogenic in this symptomatic cohort. And so overall, we still see this highly similar antibody clarity, um pattern consisting of an early peak and a biphasic decay. And then by comparing to our um, positive control, which is the highly exposed PNG adults, we can see how the antibody response is basically is fluctuating between the maximum and the minimum. Then we use the uh, 27 immunogenic antigens to determine the IgG kinetics, but this time in the asymptomatic cohort. Um, a bit on how different this asymptomatic cohort is to the symptomatic. So one thing is that this asymptomatic cohort had more past exposure than the symptomatic, and they were basically selected in, um, from a larger observational cohort um, conducted in a rather nearby region in Western Thailand. And they were um, showing positive um, PCR results when it comes to Vivax infections, and um, they were infected within the six months of first six months of the study. And again, we make sure that there were no recurring infections throughout. So in the asymptomatic cohort, uh, we see that um, in red, that the peak and the decay are not as distinct as they are in the symptomatic in blue, and out of the 27 antigens, 21 of them are long-lived, and the six are not immunogenic, and there were no short-lived antigens. So this really shows that the level of um, past exposure can really affect the antibody 
and maintenance. Then we use the same 27 um, immunogenic antigens to determine the IgG subclass profile. And again, we see that IgG subclass kinetics are antigen specific. And um, before most of them, specifically 13 of them, um, are very prominent, have very prominent IgG1 response, which is in red. And sometimes they will also have some IgG3 in green. And very few of them have most, mostly IgG1 and some IgG2 and 3. And there are also some of them just don't seem to have shown any obvious dominance. So here I'm using the same four antigens as um, representative examples, just to show you how different the IgG subclass um, profile can look between regions with different level of transmission. So if you look at the Thai samples in green here, uh, with very little exposure, IgG1 is the dominant response, and followed by IgG3, SUM2, and very little 4. Um, but if you look at PNG samples in orange, with lots of exposure, IgG1 is still the dominant response, but with a much higher IgG3 response. So this shows that the magnitude of IgG subclass response can be quite heavily affected by the level of pass exposure in your region. And then we determine the IgM kinetics using the 15 um, antigens that show IgM positivity at the peak of response. And this is defined as plus two standard deviation above the, the baseline at week one. So again, I'm just showing three representative examples. And they, they show IgM responses are antigen specific and can be long lived. And interestingly, seven of the antigens with a long lived IgM profile were actually not IgG immunogenic in the symptomatic cohort. And when we plot um, the IgM and IgG together, we found that IgM in blue has very similar kinetic pattern compared to IgG in green, uh, in red. And so this, is, this pattern consists of, again, an early peak and a decay, but sometimes this pattern is not as obvious um, for some proteins. Um, but I think the most surprising finding um, when we do this is that for some antigens, IgM can actually be more long-lived than total IgG. So a summary of my first aim, that we see that anti antibody kinetics are antigen-specific, but follow highly similar patterns, which is this peak at one or two weeks post-infection followed by biphasic decay. And we also see that IgG1, sometimes IgG3, are the dominant responses. So this observation is highly consistent um, with past findings, but we were surprised to see long-lived IgM responses without any boosting infections. And lastly, we see total IgG can be better maintained after an asymptomatic inf inf infection than symptomatic. And so moving on to my second aim. So for this aim, essentially we were just wondering what factors um, can affect the antibody responses between antigens or even between individuals. And this is a critical question to ask because it is one of the major reasons why so many malaria vaccines had failed in the past. So. Um, after some lit review, um, I sort of roughly categorized all the reasons into three categories. Some of these intrinsic host factors um, can be something about the age, the sex, the um, ethnicity, or the physical condition of the human host, or it can be the, something about the environment, um, particularly the level of transmission in a region, or if you use any in, um, interventions to change that level of transmission. And last and quite obviously, um, it can be something um, to do with the parasites and the antigens they're carrying. So 
Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the antigenic variation. The VAR and the multigene families are perfect examples of this antigenic variation. And this is referred to as the, um, the, the recombination of different genes in the same family to change the outer coat of the parasites to avoid um, detection by the immunity. And also, other than this, it could also be the level of diversity in the antigenic sequence or polymorphism that affects how effectively our antibodies recognize um, the parasites. And so for my second aim, we focus on the polymorphisms, and particularly polymorphisms in the antigenic sequences and how they are associated with this antigen-specific antibody kinetics. And additionally, uh, we were just wondering if this effect remains the same between symptomatic and asymptomatic cohorts. So for this purpose, we use um, population genetic analysis to do this. Um, so it, it identifies polymorphisms and quantify the sequence diversity for us. And it also helps um, identify antigens targeted by host um, immunity. So this whole population genetic analysis involves two main steps, processing and analysis. So the processing step um, it was performed with Jacob's help and started by mapping more than 300 Vivax isolate sample sequences to our reference strain, PO1. And we found 49 out of 52 antigens on PO1, which um, were then annotated based on their function. And so these sample sequences went through two different um, filtering processes to be selected based on their sequence quality. And then we pick out um, the 19 samples from Thailand from the remaining sequences, um, then to remove their insertion, deletions, and some singletons. And then I think most importantly, we trimmed off the, um, the access um, sequences flanking the actual construct that we use for antibody uh, measurement so that the correlation will be more um, realistic in that sense. And then and the sample sequences were then analyzed using an R package called VaxPack, developed by Elijah and Mio, and um, which really just produces multiple antigenic diversity parameters here. So, um, so length is one of the parameters that we looked at, um, which can be obviously associated with the number of apitopes it contains. Um, both segregating sites and nucleotide um, diversity describe and quantify nucleotide um, polymorphisms. They were just calculated differently. And so greater the value, um, greater the diversity in the sequence. And we also know that host immunity is essentially a form of evolutionary selection force that um, can really drive an antigen to become more or less diverse in its sequence. So Tajima D is such a uh, statistic that is very commonly used to, um, to indicate the role of this host immunity, whether or not it has a more of a balancing or purifying selection force. So um, to interpret this, um, the zero is the null value, meaning that a host immunity has zero effect on the samples, and all samples have the same sequence and no variations. And a positive value means that the host immunity has a stronger balancing selection, um, balancing trait, which is more likely to keep the variance in the population. And a negative value represents a stronger purifying trait, um, which means that the variants are more likely to be removed from the population. And of course, we have to look at the number and the proportion of different types of SNPs as synonymous, non-synonymous. And lastly, we also check the uh, number and diversity of haplotypes. So here, the haplotypes are defined as combination of alleles um, in an amino acid sequence. But the way I understand it is 
that if you imagine that all infected individuals are carrying the same version of a Vivax antigen, and when they are infected again, but this time with the different version of the same antigen, the alleles can undergo recombination or spontaneous mutations even to form a more complex version of that antigen. And so this cycle can repeat itself over and over again. And plus the selection pressure from both the human and the mosquito hosts and also some other environmental factors we can really just end up with different versions of the same um, antigens, but with quite unique um, pattern of um, polymorphisms. So these are essentially known as the haplotypes, and they might take up different proportions in a population. So this is essentially how this um, haplotype diversity is calculated. So it takes and the sample size and the frequency of each type into account. And so the last five parameters here, and they all describe different types of polymorphisms and their frequencies. So higher the value, greater the diversity. And because we are looking at the protein changing polymorphisms, it is more likely for us to observe a change in the immune responses induced. So here is a spread of all population um, parameters before looking at their individual association with the antibody data. So as you can see, that most of them are quite positively skewed. Um, for example, if you look at length here on the top right corner, and most antigens have a length under 2,000 base pairs. And across the first row, you can see that they also have pretty limited nucleotide diversity and um, SNPs and more of a, a negative value for Tajimus D. But interestingly, if you look at haplotide diversity, it's more negatively skewing on the other hand, and most antigens in this Thai population have high haplotide diversity. So I think this really shows how important it is to have a look at different parameters all at the same time. And um, from this spread of data, we also identify one hypothetical protein with very high level of sequence diversity across the 19 samples in most of the um, parameters. And just another quick reminder of the two cohorts that we have, symptomatic and asymptomatic. And I'll first be showing the um, results on the um, symptomatic cohort with limited exposure. So um, in the symptomatic cohort, we first look at the distribution of each parameters um, across the three longevity categories, the long-lived, short-lived, and non-immunogenic. But as you can see very clearly, that there is no significant result. Um, but we do notice that antigens with a short-lived IgG profile tend to be smaller in size compared to long-lived and non-immunogenic. Non And similarly, we also look at the distribution um, between IgM categories, which is the IgM immunogenic and non-IgM immunogenic. And we found that the IgM immunogenic antigens in red um, are more likely to show less sequence diversity compared to the non-IgM immunogenic. So that really shows that these antigens with um, limited sequence diversity are better targets of antibody immunity. And because having really just these antigens in all these binary categories really don't show much, so what we decided to do is to use a few general antibody parameters um, to quantify this antibody responses. So these include um, IgG magnitude at week one and week 24, and we use this standard deviation as a statistic for response variation between individuals. And we also look at three negative control panel baseline and the magnitude of IgM and IgM and um, response variation. So it's a really busy thing. So 
I will only just be discussing this particular intersection of the heat map and also just these um, statistically significant results. So the first thing we see is that um, looking at the association between IgM, IgG magnitude and haplotype diversity, we see that antigens with a lower IgG magnitude um, tend to have higher haplotype diversity. So for example, the very famous MSP119 was very immunogenic in this symptomatic cohort, but with very few variation because it's very small, like, very small in size, and so it's quite different from the other antigens. And if we treat this MSP119 as an outlier in the analysis and remove it, we see that the association was reduced. And then we look at IgM magnitude at the peak of response versus the number and the diversity of haplotype. And similarly, we see that antigens with lower IgM magnitude are associated with more um, protein changing haplotypes and higher haplotype diversity. So this again shows that antigens with limited sequence diversity are better targets of antibodies. And when we look at Tajima C um, versus, versus IgM magnitude, and each point is colored by their haplotype diversity values, we see that antigens with lower IgM magnitude are more likely to be under um, balancing selection, which drives the maintenance of variance in the population. And also, most antigens with higher haplotype diversity in lighter blue here and have more positive, um, I, uh, more positive hygienicity. So this observation is very much in line with our expectation that um, the balancing selection is associated with higher sequence diversity, and this is reflected in lower and less effective IgM um, responses. And then we move on to the IgM um, response variation between individuals. And we see that higher nucleotide diversity and more non-synonymous SNPs are associated with lower IgN response variation at week one. So this doesn't really quite make sense because we did kind of expect like higher antigenic diversity are linked to um, higher response variation between individuals. And but as you can tell from this shading here, um, there is this, um, again, this outlier here, the hypothetical protein. And if we try and remove this outlier, and the um, association was gone. So a quick summary on the, uh, the results in symptomatic cohort. We see that no diversity parameters can define the IgG um, longevity category. But um, very much in line with our hypothesis for this aim, we see that higher antigenic diversity is associated with less effective, generally a less effective antibody response. And this is reflected in lower response magnitude, enhanced response variation, and also um, more of a host immunity with a balancing treat. But now the question is, what about the asymptomatic cohort? So in the asymptomatic cohort, um, again, we look at the, the distribution of different parameters across the two IgG um, immunogenic categories, long-lived and the non-immunogenic. But as you can see, that there are no significant results. And then we try to correlate the peak IgG magnitude with different parameters. There's still nothing significant. And again, we can see the two antigens popping out, the MSP119 and the hypothetical protein. And if we remove the hypothetical protein as an outlier, the association was completely gone. So in the asymptomatic cohort, here we're just looking at IgG response variation between individuals versus number and number of haplotypes 
and TouchMSD colored by haplotype diversity. So from this graph, you can tell that for antigens with a higher um, IgG response variation, we see an increase in a haplotype number and also the presence of a balancing selection again. And this is also reflected by the fact that these um, individuals with these antigens with higher haplotype diversity in lighter blue tends to fall under the influence of a balancing um, selection. So together, these results really show that an increase in sequence diversity can lead to an increase in IgG response variation between individuals and, and is associated with balancing selection again. Uh, so to summarize, we found that antigenic diversity is better associated with antibody data in cohorts with more exposure, which is the asymptomatic in this sense. And so this is demonstrated in the fact that the association between the antigenic diversity and the antibody data is more prominent in the asymptomatic compared to symptomatic. And specifically in the symptomatic cohort, we see that the association between IgM and antigenic diversity is stronger than IgG. And this really shows that the association is better represented when your immune responses are more mature. And um, moving on to my third aim. So we know that memory B cell response is critical for the production and maintenance of antibody responses because these cells differentiate into antibody secreting cells upon exposure to their antigen. And there have also been a few papers looking at memory B cell responses against Vivax um, with rather different um, results. So it has been said that a Vivax infection can decrease the total number of B cells or maintain the total number of B cells, but simply alters the proportion of different types of B cells, or it can induce long-lived memory B cell responses. So we were basically wondering if such differences when it comes to findings um, are caused by the different types of Vivax used in these studies. So what we have planned is to down-select two antigens with, um, with different um, total IgG profiles, one short lived, one long lived, and basically just monitor that um, antigen specific memory B cell response at the four time point that I mentioned earlier with the use of a um, Ellis bot assay. Um, I'm almost done with the, op uh, the optimization, so stay tuned. So um, what I really want to highlight here is that my project is really the first to establish such detailed antibody kinetic profile against such a large panel of Vivax antigens in a low transmission region with a rather complete um, sequence diversity data. And to take my current project further, um, I think the results from my first aim will be really helpful when it comes to identifying um, recent and long-term exposure, and also helps us um, to identify population at risk of infections. So all these are helpful for the development of more effective surveillance tools. Um, if you haven't read Ria's paper, please go. <laughs> it's a very nice paper. And for my second aim, um, I think it would be really quite helpful for the selection of more suitable vaccine candidates. Because by knowing the prevalence of immuno immunologically relevant haplotypes of some of these key antigens, um, we can really consider incorporating these highly conserved or even highly prevalent haplotypes as part of the chimeric or multivalent vaccine. And also by learning about the diversity of our antigens um, will really help us um, identify sequences that are better representative of um, global or local populations um, for future surveillance tools. 
Last but not least, we know that characterizing these memory B cell responses and will also facilitate the development of more efficacious vaccines. And so together, these are just um, some of these really exciting new tools and approaches and that will ultimately accelerate our progress towards malaria elimination. Even though there are still um, a few issues that we'll probably need to tackle before we implement them. Well, for example, we have to evaluate the level of impact of these approaches and just to have a think about if, how they are going to be useful in most of the malaria endemic countries. And additionally, uh, we have to take regions with higher transmission into account and adjust our um, current approaches for them. So these um, strategies are very much in line with one of WHO's current sustainable development goals, which aims to eliminate malaria by 2030. But for us, what next? Well, first we can, of course, try to complete this map by filling in information on the IgG subclass and the IgM kinetics in the asymptomatic cohort. And from there, we can use these um, antibody kinetic data for mathematical modeling with Michael's help in Paris to produce uh, these numeric um, estimates on antibody half-lives so that we can perform better and more accurate correlation tests and have a clearer picture of the differences between different um, antigens. And we can also take AIM2 to the next level, um, looking at how protein structures can affect immune responses. And as I mentioned previously, we would very much like to establish and compare the memory B cell kinetics between antigens in the symptomatic cohort. Um, so, firstly, I would very much like to thank all the study participants and the field teams for donating and collecting the samples. The samples they so selflessly do it for all of us and for this project. Without them, this would not have been possible. And a big, big thank you to my supervisors, Evil and Ria. Uh, Ria's not here today, but I know she'll be watching the recording. So hi, Ria. Oh, gosh. <laughs> hi, Ria. I'm so excited it's finally staged. Um, I'm sure we can all agree that Evil is a man with a razor-sharp mind and a very peculiar sense of humor. And But he's so generous with his feedback, both good and bad. And those really fancy sweets from Europe. I'm sure we all enjoyed, so I'm not gonna lie. And just thank you for taking me on um, three and a half years ago. And I really enjoyed this experience and I love learning from you. Thank you. And Ria, I remember the first few days I joined WeHi. Literally everyone who knew that she would be my supervisor and the first reaction from them would be, you hit the jackpot. And for the past few years, I know that they were telling the truth. Um, she is so bloody hardworking, so intelligent and very tolerating, which really puts me to shame every single day. <laughs> and, and she has had two beautiful babies for the past three years. What? Like, superwoman. And um, I would also like to thank Phil, Diana and James um, for being on my committee. Thank you for sharing your advice, your resources to achieve what we have in my mind. And it just, I couldn't be luckier to have you. And I would like to thank the whole Mueller Lab for their support, and specifically Jess. And she's basically the big sister in the lab, and she looks after me every single day. And Maria. <laughs> for some reason, all our small chats can turn into this therapy for myself, which I benefit so much from, and you give the best hugs. Um, Ewan, who's a past member of the Miller Lab, she helped me so much when I first started. And of course, Emily, Sarah, Shazia, Caitlin, and Raman, um, whose encouragement and support I so deeply appreciate. 
Additionally, the Barry Lab, specifically Alyssa, uh, who's also not here today, but her guidance um, when it comes to the pop gen analysis and interpretation is so helpful, and she's always happy to help. And of course, Mio, Elijah, Somia, Abebe, Diga, and Dolcey for your mental and technical support. And I would also like to show my appreciation to the whole PHI division, um, especially Natalie, who's again not here today. Um, I'm sure she's a life savior to most of us in the division, and I'm so glad to have her as a DIVCO. And Kat, thank you for being my friend and walking this journey with me. I could not have done this without you. And thank you for looking after me on so many different levels. I owe you. Um, I would also like to thank Jacob, Jake, okay, Jacob, <laughs> for having me with the pop gen analysis and Brandon, Vicky, for the R support, and Sam for career advice, and also Sarah for looking after the division. Uh, from the INI, I would like to thank Wai Hong, Jacob, Wen Chan, and Julie for providing us with their proteins, and Lisa, where's Lisa? Um, she helped me set up the memory B cell Alice Bot assay, and she just so generously shares her knowledge and reagents and was always happy to help at any time and to answer my hundreds of questions. I, oh gosh, these amazing people at WeHi. And I would like to thank Kony for the R script that she wrote ages ago, but we use on a daily basis still today. So this project had also some significant input from our international um, partners. So from Paris, Michael has been still um, assisting me with the mathematical modeling work, and Chetan for, provi provided, for, for providing one of the proteins, and Jason for basically your great friendship and mental support. And um, also our Japanese colleagues, Matthias, Taka, Azel, and um, Masayuki for making so many Vivax antigens in the, in the weak germ cell-free system, and as well as Dr. Jets, um, Piquet, and Bilum for, for, for all the samples and for hosting me so kindly when I was in Thailand. And finally, I would like to thank my mentor, Alice F. from IMNIS program, and also my friends, partner, and family for really just this unconditional <laughs> encouragement, support, company, patience, and, and, and tolerance throughout this time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe, for a wonderful talk. And if I could only make half as beautiful slides as you were, I'd be very, very happy. <laughs> But we will still give you a couple of questions. And the first thing I just wanted to point out that this really only, well, as beautiful as the discussion was, it only scraps the, the surface of what Zoe has done. The data sets that she has put together, particularly on antibody kinetics, are incredibly rich and deep. And there is going to be people working on this data, Zoe and people after her, for quite a few years to come. So it's really been the basis. I think you work on much, much more to come. So we have time for a couple of questions for Zoe. Thanks for a great talk, Zoe. So what do we know about this hypothetical protein that's such a big outlier? I have no idea, but um, thanks to you, I did put it through the ITASER um, prediction, and uh, I think I've done that for at least 50 of the 52 antigens for now. Um, I think need, I, I know you can only submit one antigen at a time, um, so hopefully we'll have some more conclusive results um, once we have a look at it all together. <coughs> Frequency lighting key through production in the field of gene samples. You're more frequently exposed to antigen and some protective procedures. And yeah, yeah, I think IgG1 and IgG3 in the context of malaria are protective in um, against many um, against many antigens. Um, I think one of the major reasons is that they are associated with complement activations and all that stuff. Yeah. 
and because they have higher affinity to the FCE receptors. Oh, uh, oh this one. Uh, yes. yes. So, um, Alyssa, is, is the response of dynamics of the same lots of different antigens rather than any one common antigen? But has anyone also looked at the effects of, um, has Alyssa, I guess, looked at the, the time of different effects of barging, sort of Vivax? Um, and what does, does Vivax have a barging? I don't even know. And the same, the equivalent multi gene family was VIR. In, yeah, 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 yeah so, that's right. I mean, like, is that something you looked at with your analysis? No. Do you know how getting one to respond to be against that? Because that's the mm. whole evolutionary basis of having a multi-gene family, right? Yeah. Which is avoid that sort of um, Yeah, so that's... That. Mm, no, but um, the multi-gene family is not a part of my yeah, <laughs> um, so panel, so yeah. Have anyone looked at that? Not at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, but we did try um, in Michael's mathematical modeling work, um, in the paper that I mentioned just now, um, they are trying, of, trying out different combinations of different antigens and see if that boosts the sensitivity or the specificity of the um, detection um, tools. So that might be an, alter an alternative. Yeah. Just to point out, we are some of bars, but not commonly expressed. Okay. There's 300 of them, yeah. but there is multiple of them expressible every 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 time. Uh, okay. okay. Hi. Um, Hi. Uh, your 15, 52 antigens. You mentioned that um, that part of the selection criterion was that they were secreted or membrane um, proteins, mm. um, which, for obvious reasons, I think makes sense um, as being accessible as antigens, but. You also said that um, you had all of these um, made in recombinant form. Were, were membrane proteins full length? Uh, yes. So they had the membrane embedded transmembrane or yeah. something. Yeah. All removed. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, that makes more sense. <laughs> but that's hard to do. OK. OK. Thank you so much, very much. Thank you.